that. So it's my uh, honor to introduce Dr. Corey Merkel, who is an assistant professor with the Department of Computer Engineering at Rochester Institute of Technology. He has received his BS, Master's, and PhD from RIT. And so he must really like RIT. <laughs> and he is uh, also worked as a research electronics engineer with the information directorate at Air Force Research Labs. And currently at RIT, he's the director of the Brain Lab, which is a multidisciplinary research lab exploring fundamental research to enable next generation ultra efficient and trustworthy AI systems. So he focuses both on algorithms, uh, mixed signal hardware, and design of brain inspired computing systems, as well as trustworthy AI hardware. His work has been published in several uh, premium conferences and journals and some books. And more importantly, I'm also honored to have his talk here today because Corey is a graduate of our research lab when we were at RIT, the Neuromorphic AI Lab. So we are really thrilled to see what all cool stuff he's doing in the neuromorphic computing space. So Corey, the floor is yours. All right, well, well, thank you so much, Darisha and, and Matrix for uh, inviting me to, to speak at this uh, seminar series. Um, yeah, it, it's, you know, especially being an, an alum of the, the new AI lab, although I think we called it something different back then. Uh, it's, it's just really uh, awesome to be here and to share some, uh, some updates on, on my work with all of you. So when I give these, these talks, especially for people that are you know, maybe a slightly different audience, people that are outside of the area of AI, I like to sort of start with this uh, complete sensory overload of, of information, right? Just to sort of express the enormity and really the pervasiveness uh, of AI, uh, you know, not only in academia and government, but, but especially uh, in industry. And I, so I think for an audience like this, you know, this is not too surprising, right? That, the amount of uh, effort and, and um, energy that we're spending on incorporating AI into products and, and services. Uh, but I think even a lot of people that are not in the AI domain are starting to not be too surprised by this as you know things like large language models and other really interesting AI uh, techniques are even making headlines in, in mainstream media these days. And so, I attribute, and I think most of us sort of attribute a lot of the growth and the boom of, of AI and deep learning to sort of a perfect storm of really three, three things happening uh, over the last uh, decade or more. And that's, first of all, the, you know, the fact that while Moore's Law has, has maybe slowed down a bit in the traditional sense, it's still alive and well in the sense that we're making these sort of very large improvements in computation uh, every couple of years. Uh, and beyond that, we have tons and tons of, of data available to us today, either labeled or unlabeled data that we can use to learn from. Uh, and then in addition, right, if we think about some of the key milestones in terms of algorithmic development, things like dropout, things like uh, attention, which is sort of the, the backbone and, and the key ingredient of these big transformer models, and also things like learning reverse thermodynamic processes, right, which are sort of the, the basis of these uh, artistic generative models like stable diffusion, right? Those key algorithmic developments have also played a, a, a key role and continue to play a key role uh, in today's AI boom. So I really feel that those three things, if if we took away any one of them, we wouldn't be uh, where we are today, but they've all to come together kind of perfectly uh, to lead us to uh, the really impressive things that we're seeing in the deep learning community um, in, in 2023 now. And one thing we, we have to ask ourselves is, you know, despite all of, all of the success in deep learning, what's, what's the cost that we're seeing? And this is also something that's, I think, uh, coming to the attention of more and more people, not just people like me in the neuromorphic research community, but also folks uh, that are working 
sort of purely in, in deep learning. So, for example, if we look at something like uh, convolutional neural networks that are used to classify images, and we look at, you know, what does it take to really improve their classification, even by just one percentage point? All right, we're at the point where uh, that improvement is really costing us exponentially in terms of things like uh, model size, number of model parameters. And of course, that in turn has a, a computational uh, and energy cost associated with it, and even things like carbon emissions costs. So the resource costs of deep learning are, are enormous. And not only is it because of growing model sizes, but it's really because of inefficient uh, hardware. And so because of that, we're, we're seeing that most of these AI models are, have really been limited, especially the, the most advanced and most capable have really been limited to the cloud. And so, you know, one of the questions that our group is interested in is, well, how can we open the application space of AI to more resource constrained devices? Uh, and one of the ways that myself and, and, you know, lots of other people in the neuromorphic research community have been approaching that uh, goal is by looking at biology and thinking about how does biology tend to, you know, get these very high efficiencies uh, and, and very, you know, high capability in terms of intelligent processing uh, in these sort of very efficient form factors. So just looking at numbers from about a decade ago, right? These are, I need to, uh, to update these admittedly. Uh, these would be much bigger today. Doing something like an image classification, state-of-the-art image classification uh, on sort of a traditional system, CPU or, or GPU system, just has an enormous size weight uh, and power cost associated with it. So we see, you know, huge, huge size weight in the tons, right? We're, we're talking about kilowatts. Uh, this number is in megawatts, right? If we start to think about training these huge uh, large language models, for example. And if we sort of contrast that with what's happening in biology, which, you know, we think has uh, even more capability and is sort of our gold standard for intelligence, right? We see that the efficiency is, is just enormous. It's uh, much, much better. So we have much lower size, weight, and power consumption. And, well, the question is, why is that? Why is there this huge discrepancy? And I think, you know, at least at a high level, the reason is, well, biology, intelligent, uh, or natural intelligence, and sort of artificial intelligence, right? They're really working on two completely different uh, paradigms. And we can see that if we look at some of the characteristics uh, of how conventional systems and biological systems perform computations, right? How how uh, parallelized computations are, um, how separated things like memory operations and, and uh, comp uh, computation operations are, right? We see a big contrast uh, between these uh, two property sets. And so our goal is is to think about well, how how can we close this gap? What are the what are the principles that we can borrow from this, this right-hand column in terms of uh, sort of key characteristics of biological intelligence, right? How can we take those and, and uh, apply them in artificial systems? So you can see uh, some, some of the smiling, enthusiastic faces of, of some current and former uh, lab members here. So our lab uh, has, a, has a mix of uh, PhD and, and MS students uh, from a lot of different disciplines, not, not only computer engineering and computer science, but also we work with people in mathemat uh, mathematical modeling, psychology, uh, physics, and, and a lot of other disciplines to try to attack these problems from a, a lot of different angles uh, and different perspectives. And really we can think of our, our main work as being divided into sort of three key threads. The first thread is where we're sort of taking a microscopic look at biology and we're thinking about, you know, the fundamental pieces of biological computation. So things at the cellular uh, level, things like neurons and synapses, also non-neuronal cells like astrocytes, and thinking about 
how do they perform computations? How do they do it efficiently? And also, how can we sort of replicate that uh, that computation and, and that structure and efficiency in hardware? We also look at things like, uh, you know, what's happening at the level of of sort of network of of neurons in our brain, right? How does connectivity in our brain give rise to certain behaviors? So this is kind of at the mesoscopic uh, level of of natural or biological intelligence, and not only how are how are things like neurons and and brain regions connected together, but also how are resources managed efficiently in the brain? How are things like a limited energy supply sort of distributed and managed uh, by the brain? How are, uh, how are different computational units, if you want to think of it in that way, sort of uh, scheduled and, uh, and used efficiently uh, in biological intelligence? And then finally, the, the other sort of key thread that we work on is thinking about Right, even if we sort of have designed this this neuromorphic system, and if it has all the efficiency properties that we want, it can perform a lot of you know complex functionality. It's not going to be widely adopted unless we can ensure or or provide at least some insurance that it's that it's safe uh, and reliable, especially in mission uh, and safety critical uh, applications. And so today, I want to sort of talk about you know. Three sort of postulates uh, that sort of align with um, those three areas, and a little bit of work uh, that we're doing in, in each of those threads. The first one is that uh, I think most people in the neuromorphic community believe this, right? Innovative memory technologies are really uh, one of, if not the most important, key enablers uh, of neuromorphic computing. And that's really going back to this idea that the state of the art models have you know on the order of easily on the order of billions if we look at next generation chat gpt we're talking about trillions of models potentially so if we want to take that and put it onto you know hardware and and, and sort of use it in some sort of uh, energy constrained environment we better hope that we have a really dense and efficient memory technology um, that will enable that. The second piece is is resource awareness. This is a, a uh, an idea that our group has been thinking about a lot lately. So I think resource awareness is going to be especially critical uh, at the extreme edge. So when I say extreme edge, I'm thinking of things like uh, like the Mars Ingenuity helicopter, right? So this is something that you know at the speed of light it takes several minutes 10 15 minutes even to get information to it back and forth uh from earth uh to mars uh it's something that has a flight time of, of you know maybe a couple minutes uh at most right a lot of the energy is going towards sort of spinning rotors and, and keeping this thing aloft in, in a very thin atmosphere and so how do we make sure that the little bit of energy that's left is being used most optimally uh, how do we make sure that the computational units, right, the few of them that we can afford to have on such a small payload are being used most effectively? Uh, and then finally, I, I'd like to discuss hardware characteristics uh, that sort of influence neuromorphic trustworthiness. So what's interesting about neuromorphic computing, especially analog approaches to neuromorphic computing, is that really the hardware becomes the algorithm. Uh, in a lot of ways. And so any variation, any sort of change in hardware functionality over time, any fault in the hardware, right, that's eventually going to manifest itself as a change in the algorithm. And that is going to have potentially a huge impact on the security, trustworthiness, uh, and reliability of the neuromorphic system. So thinking first about this idea of innovative memory technologies. Our group has, uh, for several years now, been uh, been working on um, this idea that we really need a, a type of device that can emulate very efficiently the behavior of, of biological synapses. So we know that, first of all, 
there's several orders of magnitude more synapses in our brain than there are neurons. So we should pay most attention to, to making the hardware implementation of those most efficient. But even thinking about a neural network uh, in terms of, you know, the complexity as the number of neurons increases, we know that uh, synaptic connections right, have, have a quadratic relationship uh, with the number of neurons. So it's really important that we spend a lot of time and focus on making sure that we have a good uh, sort of hardware level um, device that can emulate that synaptic functionality. And so Memristors uh, provide that. Memristors are, are essentially, right, if you're unfamiliar, these are just really just resistors with an electronically tunable resistance. So because they're resistors, they, they abide by Ohm's law, so they can perform a multiplication uh, very efficiently. They can also store a resistance value in a non-volatile way, so they have this, this nice memory property. And finally, because we're able to actually incrementally update the resistance value that's stored in them, they can facilitate things like learning through through gradient descent or other types of uh, other types of learning algorithms. All right, and it's really these three uh, sort of properties that we also associate with with biological neurons. And so there's this nice um, sort of high level analogy uh, between the two, and the neuromorphic community has been uh, thinking about how to use these and how, uh, how to leverage their efficiency for several years now. Well, these devices come in all sorts of shapes and, and, and sizes and, and, you know, all sorts of different sort of physical phenomena that, that give rise to how exactly they're able to store information uh, and how that information can be changed. Uh, different materials, different uh, sort of precisions, right? This becomes especially important as we think about, uh, you know, neural networks that need very high precision weights, right? We might need a very high precision uh, memristor device that can hold a lot of uh, different uh, several bits of information. And a lot of other properties like, you know, how symmetric they are as you increase or decrease their resistance. Um, you know, what are the sort of ranges, dynamic ranges of, uh, of their um, resistance values? Um, and, and several other other details that I that I won't mention here. The main point is that, you know, we're we're pretty certain that at this point, if there's a certain type of behavior we want out of a memristor, right? Somebody has probably explored it, and we can probably create uh, something that will give us that behavior. Tons and tons of these have uh, have been looked at over the years. Uh, and this this slides very busy so i apologize for that but this is just you know to, to kind of give you the idea that our our group has also looked at sort of the low level modeling uh of memristor devices so for example we've developed uh kind of a semi empirical model where we can take any of these devices that have been published in the literature right if if there's data available like how their the voltage and, and current are related to each other then we can fit that data uh, to our model, and then we can take that model and very efficiently do things like uh, spice level circuit simulations. Uh, and even as we'll see a little bit later on, we can sort of, um, to some degree, uh, sort of um, represent that behavior in higher level uh, languages like Python. So if we're gonna, you know, scale up simulations to you know, thousands or, or even millions of of, uh, of parameters, we need to do something that can be accelerated on GPU. And so we might take this sort of low level model and sort of represent it in something like TensorFlow. So we'll see a little bit more of that uh, moving forward. But the main way that that the community is sort of thinking about using these memristors is basically by integrating them into these what we call crossbar structures. And so these are basically two sets of, right, so we have a green one here uh, and a yellow one underneath. So these are two sets of wires 
that are orthogonal. And in each one of these cross points, we have one of these two terminal memristor devices. And essentially what this structure affords us the ability to do is perform a matrix vector multiplication, which uh, as many of you I'm sure know is sort of the, the critical piece of a computation in an artificial neural network. And so if we apply a, uh, a vector of voltages, right, to, to all of the sort of rows of this crossbar, what we get on the output is a vector of currents. And that vector of currents is related to the matrix of all the conductances stored in the memristor times that vector of voltages. So our group and several other groups have sort of been, you know, exploring how we can how we can use this to accelerate um, uh, and make efficient deep learning uh, algorithms. Um, and we have looked at it in a few different ways. One would be sort of voltage driven where we're applying voltages to the memristor crossbar. We've also explored this idea that we can apply currents, right? But the result in both cases is, is really the same, which is that we get this sort of nice efficient implementation of a matrix uh, vector multiplication. And, you know, there, there are a couple of issues with this structure. One is that, well, it's not very biologically plausible, um, you know, especially if we think about biological neural networks as being very sparse. What we have in this crossbar structure is basically full connectivity between two, uh, two layers in a neural network. So if we're trying to implement something like a multi-layer perceptron, this would work really well. But if we're thinking about more biologically inspired networks that have a high level of sparsity, we have to kind of rethink uh, the structure a bit. Uh, but I think more importantly, you know, another sort of drawback of, of using memristor crossbars in the way that many of us have been is that we have this sort of static constant power consumption Right, so if we have a neuron that, that has some activity, uh, uh, maybe represented as a voltage, right, until that voltage goes away, we have this sort of constant static power consumption uh, that's, that's related to the current flowing out of this crossbar. And so we'd like to reduce that or eliminate that uh, if possible. So one of the ways that our group has been thinking about doing that is sort of taking a closer look at biology and, and, and thinking about biological neurons and how they basically work right by by setting up this this concentration gradient at rest where we have a high concentration of, of uh, sodium ions outside of the cell. And that's kind of a potential energy that becomes available right uh, once we get a presynaptic spike and allows um, allows those ions to sort of flow into the cell. And of course, if enough of them do that, we get an action potential at the postsynaptic neuron. Uh, and we can kind of, you know, get something similar to that by actually applying a relatively old idea in digital design, which is called domino logic. So domino logic is basically this idea that we're going to take sort of a, a, a digital, you know, transistor circuit and we're going to break its computation up into two phases. One is a precharge phase. So this would basically be uh, analogous to a, a biological neuron setting up this uh, sodium concentration gradient. And the other would be the evaluate phase. And this is sort of analogous to what happens when neurotransmitters open up ion channels and we have sodium flowing uh, into the cell. So the way that our sort of domino logic slash biological neuron inspired uh, circuit works is we kind of, we charge up a node of our circuit uh, using a, a transistor, a, a PMOS transistor. And we uh, basically allow this node to then discharge in a second phase once we get some presynaptic uh, neuron inputs coming in and how quickly that discharges will basically determine the output uh, of our neuron. If it discharges very quickly, the output of our neuron will be one. 
if it discharges too slowly, the output of our neuron will be zero. So we basically have these binary neurons that we can think about as firing or not firing. Now to sort of you know scale this up and make it practical, we we have to sort of think about having a net excitatory and inhibitory effect, which really means we need to be able to have weights in our neural network that can be both positive or negative. And so we use this kind of the combination of sort of, you know, two of two copies of, of this same circuit, but with slightly different memristor values. And we use, we think of one of them as the excitatory uh, circuit and the other one as the inhibitory circuit. And so during the evaluation phase, both of these circuits are going to discharge and eventually their output is going to go from zero to one. But if the excitatory goes from zero to one first, then we're going to use an arbiter to sort of detect that and say the output of the final output of the neuron is one. If the inhibitory output goes high first, we're going to detect that again with the arbiter and we're going to say the output of the neuron uh, is zero. And so this allows us to get uh, either positive or negative weights based on this type of circuit uh, in our neural network. So this just shows a kind of a simple example where we're uh, basically taking a, a two layer neural network with right, two hidden nodes and one output node and we're, we're just uh, uh, solving an XOR problem. So very simple, um, this sort of left side piece of the circuit corresponds to these two hidden neurons. This right side piece of the circuit corresponds to this output neuron. Okay. And then what we have is whenever A is high and B is low, or A is low and B is high, we get during the evaluation phases, we get the output uh, equal to one. So it's giving us this, uh, this XOR type of functionality. What is also interesting about the circuit is it, it uses a technique called dynamic pipelining. So we're able to have a pipeline design uh, without any need for uh, any sort of latches or, or flip flops, just by um, sort of carefully coordinating our clocks, we're able to uh, send multiple workloads in this uh, through this design and we can have different layers working on different uh, inputs simultaneously. So to scale this up, I kind of mentioned this earlier, right? We can't do all of our simulations at, at this, the level of spice, especially if we want to sort of simulate very large networks. It, it's just too time consuming. Spice is too detailed of a, uh, of a simulation. So uh, what we do is we sort of, we simulate the, the low level fundamental circuit components in a, uh, in a spice simulation. Then we extract their key behaviors. And those might be things like memristor conductance range, uh, variability of, of memristor conductances, process voltage temperature corners. Uh, a, a key one is, is sort of the effect of noise and the stability of the arbiter circuit. Uh, because the arbiter is sort of the main thing that's telling us whether or not the neuron output is zero or one. Uh, we, we really need to make sure that we model some of the uh, non-ideal behavior of that component um, when we do our higher level simulations. So it turns out that arbiters aren't, aren't perfect. If, if the inputs, right, they're basically taking two different inputs that might arrive at different times and choosing which one came first. If the time difference between those two inputs is very small, uh, um, Excuse me. And uh, if we sort of couple that also with the idea that there's some noise in the circuit, then the arbiter has this sort of stochastic uh, behavior. And so what we what we do is we take that uh, that simulation data, that stochastic behavior, and we kind of model it uh, using some simple uh, logistic functions. So once we've extracted all that sort of low level important circuit behavior, what we do is we actually develop a TensorFlow hardware model. So this is a TensorFlow model 
but it's got some of the constraints from the actual hardware piece. And then we can train our software sort of, you know, ideal TensorFlow model to do whatever we want it to do. Uh, in this case, it's going to be image classification. We take the weights that we got from, uh, from the training of our model and convert those to conductances. And then we do sort of our large scale quasi hardware simulation uh, in this other TensorFlow model. So this is just an example of, of some results that we get uh, uh, got on the, the MNIST uh, training data set. So we can um, see that, you know, when we move from the ideal software implementation to the hardware implementation, uh, we do get some degradation in accuracy once we start to add uh, add noise. We also get some degradation in accuracy once we start to uh, increase the the amount of variability uh, in the memristors. So th these are sort of expected, um, but we're currently thinking through how we can sort of push all these curves uh, up a little bit. Uh, and we can also, you know, get a pretty good idea of what our power consumption uh, of our circuit would be uh, just based on a linear estimate uh, with, with some sort of smaller level, uh, low level spice. Uh, simulations. And so if we look at how our circuit compares with some other works that have looked at sort of the same data set and have similar sort of network structure, uh, in some cases, we're, we're much more uh, efficient in terms of energy and, and area. In other cases, uh, you know, we're sort of comparable, but I think, you know, we have a few ideas for how we can improve uh, the efficiency a bit more. And so we're uh, looking forward to to working on some of that um, going forward. Okay, so the next piece I I want to talk about is sort of thinking about resource uh, awareness and and depending on uh, you know how quickly I get through this, we'll also go to this third piece about trustworthiness. Uh, but you know, resource awareness, the way we've been sort of thinking about it is. Really, AI, in my view, and I think in a lot of people's view, is really just the the automation of the human decision making process. So we think about the cost of of making a decision, whether it's an AI or not. You know, there, there's kind of two components associated with that. One is, well, how much time and energy and resources did it actually take to to make the decision, right? Uh, and then how much is the cost associated with actually executing that decision? Not just executing it, but also, you know, any any fallout or long term uh, effects of it. And so we can kind of think of our total cost as, as some weight between these two things. Uh, we call that weight the, the relative cost, uh, and that's the alpha value. So, so you know, something like. Uh, something that's time sensitive, for example, might have a, a high alpha value, right? We, we don't want to take too long to make a decision. Uh, we're, we're okay, maybe, right? Uh, this, this shouldn't be the case, but this happens a lot in academic publishing, right? Sometimes we'll put out some work that maybe isn't ex perfect, right? It's not quite where we want it to be, but we have some time constraints and we want to get it out there before anyone else does. Okay, so we weigh the time a little bit more than we weigh the the uh, um, the, the quality right of the uh, of the submission. Low alpha things would be like disease diagnosis, right? Um, so we're perfectly happy to have a panel of ten doctors, right, telling us, uh, you know, taking a few days to tell us what our disease is and what the treatment plan is um, uh, rather than basically, you know, taking the time to, um, I'm sorry, I just saw something about audio. Is the audio clear? Yes, it's clear. Okay, thank you. So, uh, 
yeah, we're we're very happy to not have a speedy, uh, you know, a speedy diagnosis and a bad treatment plan, right? We'd rather have um, the the resources and the time spent to uh, uh, to give us a, a good sort of accurate diagnosis. So in terms of a neural network, right, the way we can sort of think about that is uh, we can think of the cost of making a decision. What, you know, one way to think about that is the computational resources involved and also the amount of energy required to do something like inference. And then we can think of the, the execution cost as sort of being related to the inaccuracy, right? So I can use very few resources and make a, you know, make a very bad inference. Right, but that, of course, is going to mean that that the inference is not accurate. And so, if we if we kind of think about you know how uh, that might play out in something like a convolutional neural network, we can basically take you know a multi-layer CNN and see what happens. You know what happens if we classify just based on one layer or two layers or three layers or up to to n layers, right? We expect that the deeper the CNN is, the better accuracy we'll get, but also the higher the uh, the energy cost. And so we can make these energy versus accuracy plots, uh, which I've done here, which kind of show show the trade off, right? If if we're sort of uh, really in need of the highest absolute accuracy, then you know we're going to need fairly high energy. Uh, if we're okay with a little bit of lower accuracy, we can maybe spare some energy. The goal really is to kind of push this curve to this lower right uh, corner as much as possible. Right? That would mean we have perfect accuracy at, at no energy. That, I mean, that's not achievable, but we want to get as close to that as possible. So the question is, well, how, how do we do that? How can we sort of shift those curves a little bit towards towards that goal. And, and one way that uh, several folks have been looking at, including our group, is to sort of think about this idea that we could dynamically change the number of layers that we're using in the neural network based on the complexity of the input. I mean, this this kind of makes a lot of sense if you think about it from a, from a human perspective, right? I've always sort of uh, been sort of interested in this this idea that Right, people looking at something very complex, like a Where's Waldo image, right? They take a lot of time maybe to find Waldo, but if you then show them an image, right, where it's just Waldo and nothing else, the the decision uh, of where Waldo is 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 sort of uh, immediate. And so, you know, the question is, well, shouldn't AI be doing that as well? Shouldn't shouldn't the uh, the cost of the computation be somewhat related to the complexity uh, of the input. And so that's kind of, you know, what um, what we're sort of striving to, to get here. So if we look at basically making a, a, a classification based on all the different layers in this, in this case, it's a six layer CNN, uh, and looking at sort of the, the confidence of the classification, we get these, these distributions which sort of tend to, you know, skew uh, uh, and, and become higher and higher as we move to the uh, higher layers of uh, of the neural network. But even down here at one layer, right, there are some inputs that have very high confidence. So we should, in those cases, just use this layer's classification, right, to, as long as we trust the confidence, uh, to make the classification and save ourselves from expending all the energy associated uh, with all of these additional layers. So if we if we sort of think about it in that way, you know, basing our our classification on uh, which layer achieves some first achieves some minimal level of of confidence, then we sort of shift our energy accuracy curve from this from this dotted one or dashed one, and this is on a log plot, uh, down to this, this dotted one. So we, we move, start to move it a little bit towards, uh, towards our goal, and we can get some uh, fairly significant uh, energy savings 
um, by doing that. Uh, we've also been thinking about, you know, how do we uh, manage resources or how do we think about, you know, energy constraints and resource constraints from more of a biologically inspired point of view, uh, specifically energy. So we've been looking at, you know, how, how does the brain manage energy and regulate energy? And a lot of that is done by astrocytes, which are these non-neuron non uh, glial cells. Right, so they sort of take glucose from from the blood and metabolize it, and then um, distribute it to to neurons in a in a form that uh, that they can use. And let's see if I can get this to advance. And so, sort of from from that inspiration or from that idea that real neurons have a real energy constraint, we started uh, using this idea of um, you know, taking groups of neurons in, in a spiking neural network, in this case, it's a, a liquid state machine, which is a particular type of uh, spiking neural network, and sort of limiting their energy supply. Uh, uh, you know, basically every time they, they spike, the amount of energy is, is depleted by some, and then there's some constant uh, replenish rate. And so we were interested in, you know, what happens to the dynamics and also the the performance of the network uh, if we if we start to add those those real energy constraints like that. And what we found was was pretty interesting. So, um, well, I think interesting, but also aligned with with some other uh, studies that have been done. Uh, and that is that, right? It's not at no energy constraints that we get the best performance. Um, it's really when we start to constrain the uh, the sort of or increase the amount of energy that's required for a neuron to spike. Right when we when we start to do that is when we start to see this sort of uh, maximum um, in our in our performance of our network. Um, now there's a lot of reasons this could be happening, uh, but we don't think it's directly tied to just something like regularization uh, of activity. What what we found is that this sort of energy constraint mechanism having these pools changes some of the uh, very complex dynamics of things like liquid state machines uh, by modifying things like their separation ratio, which is sort of a standard metric for LSMs, and also modifying their uh, uh, their Lyapunov exponent, which sort of determines how close to chaos um, the LSM is operating. So the, the key point here is that right, energy and accuracy aren't always necessarily at odds. It might be... Um, uh, a big opportunity for us to think about, well, can we actually get better performance out of the system by constraining it more? Okay, and I'll just say, if I think I'm just about out of time, but I'll say just a couple of things about uh, neuromorphic trustworthiness. So I think many of you are probably familiar with with the basic problem of, of uh, adversarial machine learning, right? The idea is that a lot of the machine learning models that we're training these days are, are kind of brittle in the sense that a small modification of the data that they've been trained on can cause a huge uh, uh, sort of high confidence misclassification. Um, and from our perspective, right, the reason that's happening is is, is very simple. We're basically employing training algorithms that are just drawing decision boundaries too close to the data in the input space, right? So that's the easy part. The hard part is, well, how do you not do that? And that's what tons and tons of people uh, are working on uh, in the adversarial AI community. But our interest is really more from a hardware perspective, right? We want to know if we have some set of of things that can go wrong in hardware, 
how is that going to affect the adversarial robustness? So I mentioned earlier that neuromorphic computing, really the right the the hardware is the algorithm in 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 some sense. And so if we have faults or or changes in in behavior of the hardware over time, that's going to modify the algorithm, and in turn, that's going to modify the algorithm's uh, robustness. Um, I'll just kind of skip over this. I mean, this we've been looking at this from more of a pure mathematical point of view. So how do changes in uh, hardware characteristics sort of modify the geometry of decision regions in neural networks? Um, we've been able to sort of say a couple of limited things for very simple types of, of decision regions, uh, but there's a lot more work, I think, to be done from this angle. Uh, and I'll just finish up here with the idea that our more recent work has sort of been looking at, you know, if, if you're wearing the hat of the attacker, if you measure the power consumption coming from a neuromorphic system based on these emerging memory technologies, uh, what kind of information uh, would that power uh, information give you? Or what kind of leverage would that power information give you? And what we've been able to show is that the, the power information can tell us a lot about the sensitivity of uh, the neural network's performance with respect to different inputs. So we've uh, sort of seen that, uh, for example, if you look at the true sensitivity which is, uh, this is for an MNIST data set, uh, the true sensitivity of the loss with respect to inputs versus some, this is sort of a proxy for the power consumption. So if you look at that power consumption uh, with respect to the different inputs, there's this very high correlation between the two. So we learn a lot as an attacker about the sensitivity of a model just by measuring the power consumption and not even knowing anything about the model itself. Uh, and we've been able to also then go on and show, well, we can use that information to more effectively attack uh, these types of neuromorphic systems. Okay, so I think uh, I'm going to skip to my conclusions here, so I make sure there's time for questions. Um, you know, I would say the, the current trajectory of AI I mean, it doesn't seem to be sustainable. Uh, the, the size and the rate that the size of AI models is growing is uh, is um, pretty pretty incredible, right? A lot of the, the the big models, right? We would never even be able to uh, work on really at at in a university setting. You need enormous resources um, to work on those. And so I think things like innovative memory technologies and, and algorithm breakthroughs are going to be needed to sort of uh, think about how we can expand AI without just increasing model size. Uh, and that's going to be things like new memory technologies um, and also thinking about how we can manage effectively the resources that we might have in, a, in an edge uh, setting. Uh, finally, I'll just say that neuromorphic computing, I think, uh, really, it's a multidisciplinary field, um, and I think most of the innovations have come and will continue to come at the intersection uh, between different disciplines. Uh, and I think that's also where the most exciting work, uh, and for me, the most enjoyable work uh, uh, happens. So thank you all very much for your time. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, hello, uh, great presentation. Thank you very much for sharing this with us. Uh, toward the end here, under conclusion, you mentioned you know, one way forward would be through new memory technologies. Uh, do you recall, or do you uh, have specific technologies in mind that you see as the main leading uh, fronts in terms of memory? Yeah, so right now, I, I mean, I'm really excited about ferroelectric memories, especially ferroelectric FETs. So these would have a slightly different structure than 
uh, than, than the sort of memristors that I showed. These would be sort of, it, it look more like three terminal transistors. Um, but I think a lot of the ferroelectric devices have shown pretty good uh, reproducibility in terms of their switching behavior. They have a fairly high level uh, number of, of, of states that can be achieved. So they're sort of relatively high bit uh, precision, right? Their, their wear out mechanisms seem to take a little bit longer. Um, so that's, that's a technology that I've been watching pretty closely and collaborating with some people here at RIT on. Understood. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Questions? Um, just trying to see if anybody has their hand raised. Sorry, Juan Gomez. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Uh, thank you for presenting today. I really enjoyed uh, hearing what you have to say about all of this. A question that did pop up in my head uh, when it uh, coming to the memristors, is there any uh, fabrication or new challenges when it comes to uh, creating these devices compared to typical transistors? Yeah, I mean, the the main challenge with a lot of the new, any new device, not, not even just memory, is sort of CMOS compatibility. So, our right, CMOS is kind of how we, that's the sort of conventional technology, the transistor technology. And we're not going to completely eliminate that, right? We still need that to a large degree to implement neuromorphic systems, even the ones that use memristors. So finding a good, you know, uh, fabrication process and the right materials that can sort of leverage the existing CMOS fabrication techniques uh, and, are, and are also compatible with CMOS and transistor materials um, I think that's been one of the, the big challenges, but there are some groups that have, have been able to um, have some success in that area. Glad to hear it. Thank you, sir. Yep. Uh, I think next we have Fatima. Hi, Dr. Marco. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I just had a question about like um, the memristors in general, like I saw that you were talking about like the high level abstraction of memory store non idealities. So there are quite a few of them. I was wondering which one of those non idealities would you say are the most important to capture in these high level abstractions? And the second question, I guess, is a follow up. So yeah. when you have this sort of non idealities, it somehow does impact your accuracy, right? So I was thinking like when you kind of want to make those decisions as to whether the energy savings is worth the degradation in the accuracy, right? And it is also impacted by what's the degree of non-ideality that you see in a particular device. Do you have any guideline in mind as to how we can make that sort of decision and kind of set those boundaries on those non-idealities that, you know, if you if we talk, think about variability, maybe uh, a variability above this percentage is not acceptable for the, you know, performance of the network? Yeah, so I'll start with the second question because uh, I have a simple answer, which is that we're not sure yet, but that's kind of the direction we're heading in. We want to, you know, we want to be able to have some sort of rules of thumb that that might tell us, um, you know, not just from a clean accuracy point of view, but also from an adversarial robustness point of view, right? What levels mm -hmm. of, of, of variability might be acceptable based on, you know, what are the sort of accuracy and, and, uh, and robustness requirements of our application. So, so we, we're headed there. We're not quite there yet. Uh, but for your first question, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So what I showed, especially this sort of domino logic neuron, right? So, so all of that's just inference, right? When we're, we're sort of mm -hmm. doing the training offline and then we assume that we can you know, program these, these weights in. Um, I think 1 of the things. Th that is going to play a big role, uh, especially if we start to do the learning on chip or, or you're right, things like asymmetric nonlinearity, um, has shown to have a, a big impact on, on how much you're actually even able to train, uh, the network. So that's where, if you have, you know, a small increase in one direction, it might be a huge increase if you go 
uh, in the other direction. Um, other things, just from more of a circuit design point of view, are, are things like off off current uh, or off mm -hmm. resistance, or sorry, on, on resistance. So, right, uh, applying a, a, an above threshold voltage to a memristor that has a very small resistance uh, is very hard, right? Because you have all these voltage drops across all the driving circuitry. So, so things like having a, a relatively high on resistance, uh, at least from from the designs we've been looking at, turns out to be uh, relatively important. And that, I mean, there are some other things like, uh, like maybe the device isn't purely ohmic. Maybe it, there's some tunneling happening. So maybe the IV curve for a particular state is not linear. Maybe it's a more exponential. Um, those things I can I think can be handled by just you know making sure that you're working at lower voltages when you're uh, doing inference rather than training. But you know once you start to get into more bio inspired designs where inference and training aren't necessarily so decoupled, then then that might start to be become an issue. Thank you. But does that that gives me some insight? Yes. Your question. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Corey. We have one more question from Vedant. Hi, Corey. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It was great. Uh, I had a question related to uh, the memristors. So you showed a list of memristors that are available uh, currently uh, in the field, right? So how would you, how, how would you suggest like? Uh, how would we select a particular memristor for our application? What would be the right one? How do we select one? Yeah, well, that's a question I'm still trying to answer myself, to be honest. But and, and by the way, that that's just one review paper from one group, you know, from one year. Uh, the, the list is much larger than what I showed. Um, I, I think there's a few things. What, what I wouldn't, what I don't like to see is. Uh, I think you kind of need to look at what is going to really be feasible in terms of manufacturing, large scale manufacturing. Uh, and, you know, I wouldn't try to design a circuit around very specific device characteristics because whether or not that particular device with those characteristics is going to, in the long term, be feasible to fabricate and be CMOS compatible and, and all those kinds of things, right? There's no guarantee. So I think it's better to think about designing a circuit around devices with properties that fall into some sort of range that is representative of the types of, of, of devices that, you know, you're seeing papers where they're actually fabricating these things and you know with CMOS circuits and um so th that's that's one part of the answer the other part of the answer is is sort of you know back to to what i was talking about with fatima which which is you know think about the non-ideal behaviors and the uh the sort of design stress that the the device is going to place on on your circuit. So you want to make sure that you're either using a device that doesn't have any of these non-idealities uh, or, uh, which I think is more interesting, you're, you're leveraging those non-idealities, maybe some stochastic behavior uh, in a useful way for computation. So that's a long-winded way of, of telling you, uh, yeah, I, I don't think there's a magic recipe yet for choosing a device. Uh, but you have to take a lot of different things into consideration. Thanks. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, do I see any more questions in the chat? No. So, Corey, I think uh, you started doing a lot of this energy analysis. That is uh, really good to see. I think people finally doing that analysis for power and energy and how much it takes to use these systems. 
um, if you have to think of using a purely neuromorphic system based on the uh, memory technologies that we have currently, or you expect that will be prominently used in the coming years, what do you think would be the savings um, we will have by using this technology for AI at edge application? I know it's a very broad question and you won't have a exact numerical answer for it, but. Yeah, so, I mean, it is hard to say. So uh, there are, so anecdotally, I can say, you know, uh, even from our own work, we've, we've seen for sort of small, relatively toy problems, there's, there's orders of magnitude, uh, potential efficiency improvements when you move from something like uh, like a CPU to, to a purely neuromorphic processor based on emerging memory technologies. Um, what, what I don't know yet and where I haven't really seen a lot is, uh, and you know, this very well as well, right? How does that, how does that scale? Right? When we start mm -hmm. thinking about real problems. Uh, not not MNIST. I know I did a lot of MNIST image classification in this talk. Okay, but if we move beyond that, right? If we move to, you know, even a system where neuromorphic computing is just a piece of the puzzle, mm -hmm. right? Uh, then how does how does it scale? I, I'm not sure because, you know, if you think about something like a UAV, most of the energy is going towards keeping the UAV in the air, right? right? So if you look at the percentage improvement of, of the energy from a CPU to a uh, to a neuromorphic processor, I think, you know, it's going to look fairly small. But I mm -hmm. think the more important question is, if you have that sliver of energy available, right, can, right. You, can you do more more efficiently with it in a neuromorphic system than you could with a conventional computing system. Okay. So, yeah, it's it's a uh, yeah it's an it's it's a question I I hope we'll have an answer to soon, but I think it's going to take some time still. Um, or maybe the other way I wanted to ask about is like you see all these edge AI processors coming from the mainstream machine learning approaches, right? Whether it's using ultra low bit precisions or whether they're using different types of architectures that are stripped down to basic elements in their piece. So there's a lot of those approaches. So do you still think that compared to those type of approaches that are targeted for the edge that neuromorphic still stands or has an advantage? Yeah, I do, but I but I think it's you know it's not a silver bullet. It's we we got to think about what are the the right problems for neuromorphic computing. Um, so I think something like classifying ImageNet images. Mm -hmm. right? I don't I don't think that's the right problem for neuromorphic computing. Uh, I think once as a community we can identify what those problems are, and it's probably going to be something where you have very noisy data with, mm -hmm. with sort of spatially, temporally varying signals, uh, multimodal signals. Um, then I think neuromorphic is going to show a big advantage, especially if we can sort of leverage some of the key pieces of neuromorphic, like sparsity, like event-driven computation. Um, so yeah, I mean, my my answer is yes. I mm -hmm. I'm confident and I'm optimistic that there is uh, there is still going to be an advantage. But I think as a community, we still need to do a little bit of work to to identify well what are the important uh, the important applications. And I think those are really the applications like Mars ingenuity, right? I mean, to me, that's that's one of the best uh, best examples that we can that we can identify. We have a huge, huge constraint in terms of available resources, mm -hmm. and we have to sort of think about 
what's the best we can do with in an intelligent way with with those limited resources. Um, so I yeah I would sort of summarize by saying yes, uh, but some work still needs to be done to say uh, in what domains. Yeah. Right. And I I think I think in the end we're gonna have a mixture of neuromorphic systems, a mixture of event driven deep learning systems, GPUs. Right. Everything's gonna sort of uh, have its own place for a different set of applications. Absolutely. I agree with that. So thank you so much. This is a fun time to be in this research field and you're doing really cool stuff. And thank you so much for sharing that with our matrix researchers and our students. And, uh, if anyone has questions on today's conversation, um, feel free to reach out to Corey. If you're not able to reach out to him, you can always connect with me. But uh, we'll try to post this talk on YouTube pretty soon. All right, great. Thank you, Darisha, and thanks to to Matrix for the for the invitation. It's great, to, great being with you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, Corey. Take care.